Thanks very much. Um, we're, this morning, we're just going to try and uh, do something a bit more informally for our plenary, so we're having a dialogue. However, we're not terribly well rehearsed. Um, the um, idea is um, that I'm going to talk a little bit about um, research that myself and colleagues have done uh, in relation to why people have participated or may hesitate to participate or may have concerns about participating in clinical research. And I'm going to do that in three different small slots. Uh, and then Sean is going to kind of respond to some of those issues by talking about um, existing, kind of, existing regulatory and legal framework, some of the ethical issues. Um, as well that uh, arise from uh, the empirical research that myself and colleagues have done. And then we hope in that way that each of these will kind of throw out additional questions uh, for, to be explored this afternoon alongside the big questions that um, Steve put up. Um, as a uh, social scientist and a lawyer, um, we work, uh, we and our colleagues work quite closely together to see how uh, empirical data that uh, involves going up and speaking to people, um, scientists, um, physicians, and uh, a wider population, how their views might help shape um, how to best uh, govern and create robust regulation around um, Quite different types of clinical research. So we have a kind of history of working, of working together as well. So first of all, the first thing that I wanted to, to begin to unpack is why do people participate in clinical research? We've heard response rates in Scotland, and um, particularly for large biobank type research, uh, is, is pretty good. The, the Generation of Scotland study um, that Anne mentioned um, is, is doing very well, has done very well in terms of recruitment. Interesting to find out what it is then that has motivates people to participate. Um, and the existing research that has looked at um, why people participate in clinical trials and other types of, um, of clinical research would suggest that there are a range of things. Some, sometimes it may be through a form of altruism, um, some notion therefore of kind of helping others, or some notion of the greater good um, or, the, or the common good. Research that myself and uh, a colleague, Jill Haddo, um, that, 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 that we were involved with, that was looking at people who were who had participated in Generation of Scotland, um, found that there were a whole range of reasons why um, why people had actually participated. Jill interviewed people who, who had participated, and this particular study required those individuals to then approach family members because the study of recruiting. Um, uh, individuals and their um, close blood relatives. And the study found that people were keen to participate if they had a family history of disease, so in a sense the participation was publicly relevant to them and their families. They also talked about kind of leaving a legacy, so even though there may be no direct benefit to an individual to participate in these large scale projects, um, the idea that it might help future generations, not in an abstract, actually, in terms of the next generations of our own family. So just to, uh, one quote here from a man who says, I'm 64 and only 20 years ago. It won't bother me, and I can become a grumpy old man and tell them to get lost, he means the clinical researchers. Um, but if it's something which might help my children, my grandchildren in particular, I do think about how things will influence them. So there's some sense of generational responsibility here. Um, also, some people talked about putting something back into the NHS um, as a kind of recompense of care they had received. Some people talked about receiving health benefit themselves because the actual process of participation um, involves some clinical um, data, some of which may be paid back. Um, but also, the research found that actually people make decisions in often kind of quite haphazard way. It's almost snap decisions, not necessarily really well thought through, um, but based on a personal context, family context, and also who does the asking. And then these same people use a range of strategies then to recruit their family members, drawing on these kind of repertoires about leaving legacies and um, talking about family illness, and used both kind of ask their family members to be involved, 
providing some with some sense of an obligation to be involved, or even actively persuading others to be involved. And they did this because they knew the families, knew their family members, knew how they would like to be respond, likely to respond, and also knew their tendency, whether they might not participate because they couldn't get around to it, but were a little bit of uh, pushing might decide to participate. But we also know these projects require large numbers, um, and in addition to speaking to those who had become involved in over generation Scotland, we also conducted a survey with the general population to see um, what kind of factors uh, they describe as would be likely to influence whether or not they would participate. So it's hypothetical these people weren't necessarily being asked to participate. And we were particularly interested in whether certain aspects of governance that we know are important and have formed part of our discussions this morning and certainly this afternoon, like informed consent, the need to have a right to withdraw, um, having concerns about who accesses um, the data that are generated from these large-scale studies, whether these were influential. And it actually, we found that in lots of ways they didn't seem to be influential in how people reported their willingness to participate. And again, this is a uh, hypothetical scenario, uh, it, was a, it was a survey, but actually really replicating the interview study, people were more likely to say they would participate if they had uh, some direct, um, relevant, something directly relevant in terms of their own experience of illness or those um, in their family, for example. Um, that they, had, they would say things like they wanted to help or they knew someone with a particular disease. Um, However, how one generates data or collects um, social data around individuals, their decisions, and their kind of um, attitudes towards clinical research also shapes what people tell you. So in different contexts, you can generate different types of data. And we also did studies that allowed um, a greater dialogue amongst um, the population around issues to do with um, clinical research and generation of Scotland in particular. And in those contexts, uh, what we identified was quite often rather more ambivalence um, about participating in research. But we'll come on to that um, in the middle of the session. So first of all, then, given that the di there's diverse reasons about participating that are not necessarily related to the aims of research, I think the question is, um, what does this mean then for um, the legal framework and for ethical analysis? Okay, <clears throat> I guess uh, I'll, I'll preface my, my comments on, on, a, on, a, on a general statement first, and that is that the, the governance around research, whether it's clinical, whether it's basic, uh, is very complex. Uh, and so, and it's, and it's quite voluminous as well. So, governance can come from, from treaties, from international declarations, from professional guidelines, from statutes, from regulations. Um, so there's, there's a lot, there's a, there's a complexity around um, what, what researchers uh, have to sort of fit their activities into and then what participants are actually doing. So that's, that's the, first, the first thing I would say and sort of in response to some of your points. The, the governance framework that's created by these instruments, um, by this plethora of instruments really, um, really does, I think, try to the extent possible to capture um, to some extent why people are participating in, in research. So it's trying to create a system that reflects why people are participating in research. So it's trying to ensure that the research is uh, clear in objectives, uh, aimed at something that we as a society feel worthy, um, is done in a way that is safe for people to participate in, uh, and leads to sort of real and useful interventions. Additionally, the system that we have is really geared toward um, physical interaction. Uh, so uh, a physician or researcher uh, doing something with the person's body. So the, the, the type of research that's now emerging is quite a new research model, this population-based uh, 
focusing a lot more on on information than on the, that actual sort of physical uh, direction creates a lot of um, a lot of challenges for the existing research for the existing research for creating genes. But it's, you know, you mentioned a few things about people having this idea of, sort of intergenerational justice and this idea of, sort of giving something back to the, to the healthcare system. And you see these ideas captured in, in some of the in some of the government's documents. So for example, UNESCO has been very active in creating universal declarations on the human genome and human rights and the universal declaration on bioethics and human rights. And you see these, these instruments, which are quite influential as, as you sort of trickle down to the, to the domestic and to the institutional, particularly in jurisdictions that aren't as well developed as, as the UK. So they don't have the same um, robust sort of regulatory frameworks, and so they rely to a lot more extent on these international guidelines because there's in some ways ready made. So you see in these instruments um, ideas about trying to trying to encourage um, the science to be aware of this, to say, you know, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to have intergenerational justice. We want um, to protect and promote uh, the autonomy of people, but also the solidarity um, between people. So I think, you know, these ideas are to some extent captured in, in, the, in the governance frameworks. Um, and you also mentioned about snap decisions that were that were sometimes made, and I think particularly in the in the legal part, in the legal sort of elements of the, of the governance frameworks, it assumes a lot more consciousness, a lot more conscientiousness about making decisions, and it creates all kinds of mechanisms around making informed, uh, very reflexive decisions. So you do, I suppose, you know, that demonstrates that there is some sort of break between practice and between what they expect. I think that um, takes us on into the really deep questions about the concerns that people have raised about participation and then whether a model of informed consent is so at the heart of the way in which we orient ourselves towards these issues, whether that is continues to be fit for purpose. Because a lot of researchers identified that uh, people have difficulty making sense of the um, uh, randomized controlled trial procedures um, that Steve outlined and the rationale behind randomization. And, some, and this will be despite the provision of the information and may speak much more to a kind of embodied response to um, participating in something like a clinical trial. Um, there is evidence, for example, that people have a preference to be in the treatment arm or the new treatment arm um, in, the, in a trial. Um, and research that uh, one of my PhD students, Helen Everell, our PhD student in the past, um, conducted looking at people who were participating um, in a large trial about the prophylactic use of aspirin uh, to prevent future um, uh, cardiac and uh, vascular events. Um, interviewed people who had participated, but also people who had chosen not to participate despite being invited and being eligible to participate in the trial. So they've gone a way along that process of, of, of recruitment and then decided not to participate. And also people who had dropped out um, at some point during um, their participation um, in the trials. And the reasons that people um, said that the reasons that people gave for declining to participate, again, were varied. Sometimes um, kind of quite mundane reasons, maybe just kind of didn't fit in with um, their, their kind of everyday concerns, or there were other issues that were of higher priority to them, but also concerned about the kind of long term commitment that um, is often required for clinical trials. So one person said, I think it was too much of a hassle for me, and I thought, well, if it's not too serious, in other words, it's worth asymptomatically for being recruited into a trial, um, although identified as being a potential risk. It might sound stupid, but I'm not going to bother. At the end of the day, would it have been beneficial? Or someone else said, I didn't want to commit myself. Or people didn't necessarily feel at risk, um, and so therefore didn't want to um, risk any risk of participating, so they didn't want to put themselves at any risk, and we use terms like they don't want to be ambiguity. 
wouldn't want to accept um, a blind application as well. Um, and people really did try to sort of um, identify um, whether or not they were going to be allocated to the seabird. However, other people might be um, concerned about participating actually because of the trial drug in this case aspect. It's a common drug that people want to say no, but sometimes it doesn't suit them or you have um, side effects. So they might be put off participating for that reason. And the reasons that people said they dropped out were sometimes because of side effects from um, the trial medication, which obviously reveals itself in that respect despite um, double binding, or uh, because of the particular health event they had or some other treatment that they were having for a health condition that that we have an influence then on the trial. Some people then were regretful about having to drop out the sense that they would have sort of let down the um, study um, organisers and the scientists because they could no longer participate. Um, so I think that that's quite interesting to look at why people um, don't participate. And similarly, although we have reasonably high response rates in Scotland in relation to biobanks, again, people haven't um, um, put across a whole range of different reasons as to why they might not participate or express concerns about the whole enterprise of clinical research um, and particularly large-scale um, genetic studies. Um, the survey that I've mentioned before um, in relation to Generation Scotland um, where people said that they would be unlikely to participate um, if they were asked, again, gave quite mundane reasons, they were too busy, take too long, they weren't interested, um, didn't like needles, um, and also some expressing issues about security and um, anonymity, um, as we would, as we would um, expect people to do. But as I said right in, uh, earlier on, uh, when we conducted research that involved um, having uh, much kind of denser dialogues with people about large-scale um, genomic studies for research, we did identify in those what we would describe as quite high levels of ambivalence about certain aspects of the way in which such research is, is structured and conducted, which is not the same as um, an outright rejection at all of, of this research. I think in, in general, quite positive um, orientations towards uh, the clinical research um, arena in the Scottish context. Um, but people were concerned particularly about the wider institutional arrangements with <coughs> which research is conducted. And I think this is um, quite an important point to take into discussions this afternoon. On the one hand, we can focus on individuals and what motivates them, um, but also those same individuals are quite reflective and quite knowledgeable about the wider structures within which um, science takes place. And here, the issues that um, we raise would be issues about well, who has access to data, and um, what's the relationship between the NHS and private companies in relation to the generation of these data and subsequent use of them, um, and what uh, can individuals themselves have any input into that process, so in a sense what happens subsequently is still something about which individuals participating or, or um, thinking about participating, have, feel they have some stake in. And so there are some regulatory responses to that, for example, um, ideas about um, benefit sharing, not beyond the sense that overall for the Scottish economy, this might be good and overall for the um, well-being of the population, this might be good for whether there could be more specific mechanisms that generate some kind of a more immediate benefit sharing. Um, and Sean may uh, talk about that or other potential regulatory responses. Yeah, I'll try and touch on that as well, I guess. Um, first on this point about withdrawal. Obviously, the government's framework, really, particularly the law, does not impose the obligation to participate in research, despite our many references to, to solidarity. <coughs> um, we, don't, we don't require people to participate in in research. One of the key objectives of, of the governance framework, whether it's ethical or, or legal, is to create trust, um, justifiable trust in the science undertaking. So a lot of, a lot of this is, is aimed at, at building 
mechanisms or building institutions that will, uh, that will justify trust in, in the science. And you see this um, through things like uh, consent, uh, the protection of the right, or the right to withdraw, um, which, is, which is protected in the law and is, and is repeated in, in every research protocol that's, that's, that's designed around that you get from a uh, research ethics committee without having such a law. But, but consent is obviously the law element of, of the governance really focuses to a great extent on consent and making sure that people who consent are, are competent legally to, to consent and that they understand what it is they are consenting to. Now, obviously, the empirical evidence, um, I think, is, shows us an ambivalence as the point of people actually do, do understand. And, and so you get all sorts of things happening around consent. Um, in the US, there, there are economic studies where the, where the consent form is dozens of pages long. And so then you see a shift to this idea, well, instead of having a, a really specific consent, because in a lot of this research, generation scholar and UK biobank, we just don't know where the science will go. We don't know what uh, to, what researcher five years down the road is going to come to the bank and say, I want to do research on this, and so I want to use, you know, I want to use your resources to do this particular research. So this this poses a problem for for consent. And so we've moved to this idea of open consent is it is it appropriate uh, for people to say, well, instead of consenting to this particular type of research, I'm consenting to participate in a biobank, all that entails. And there's obviously there's a lot of, of debate around whether that's appropriate or not, but it, it demonstrates how um, certainly in the legal circles we've come to rely to a great extent on consent as a mechanism for encouraging this trust. And I think moving forward, one of the things we might debate this afternoon is what other models might there be to encourage and to justify a trust that isn't so reliant on consent. And so you know, issues around reciprocity, issues around transparency, but what's happening, and I think this feeds into one of the points that are abstract about, about feedback um, results, um, because there there is there's also recognized, I think, within the scientific community that there's a problem with, with um, publicizing and, and feeding back negative results in particular. Um, so that's that's an issue that, that's currently being tackled, but there's, there's no real sort of simple answer to, to it yet. <clears throat> uh, as far as sort of um, Wider structures again. I would just uh, come back to this whole idea of complexity. There was there was a uh, House of Lords Scientific uh, Technology Committee two years ago, 2009, did a report, and uh, I think it was actually a genomics researcher from Scotland who said that he had to comply with 43 laws and up to 12 uh, ethics guides or professional guides in order to do the research that they they want to do. So you know that's. As far as stepping back and taking a broad view of, of the field, you know, that's that's a, a real problem for for doing good research and for getting the research that we are doing out uh, so that it actually helps people when you have to sort of navigate that kind of complexity. And that kind of complexity but might generate the trust in and the idea that we have to work with so many different guidelines. Um, and just coming on just a very uh, last um, area that we just want to raise um, this morning. Um, Anne talked about the potential in Scotland now for um, linking um, health records and the benefits of that might mm -hmm. only accrue from that in terms of understanding much more about um, the nature of disease and the impact of different treatments. Um, and. Um, I, along with uh, colleagues uh, Claudia Pagliari and Barry Aitken, are involved in looking at uh, how a range of um, the population, uh, what they think about the change of the data linking, which is obviously one's personal uh, crime and medical information being used anonymously in this context. 
as part of the Scottish Health Informatics Programme. And Scotland is very well, very well placed, particularly as Dan said, because of the unique identifier that uh, we get um, at birth and that um, sticks with us, even though we might not know it throughout, um, throughout um, our lives. And here, um, the issue that Sean has raised about the informed consent um, is highly pertinent because it is impossible to keep going back and getting consent for people from uh, a whole range of different studies with data uh, that gen is generated from them that becomes far removed from them. But of course, it is still on them, even if um, anonymized. Um, and our the initial uh, findings from our research that again is involved in dialogue begin to tackle issues um, and ambivalences in some fair. Certainly suggests that consent remains very important, I think, because it is an almost a taken for granted approach that we have, and it speaks to um, some idea of people retaining some autonomy and a sense of control. But in all the discussions we had about, the, about issues like um, confidentiality, privacy, anonymity, um, the fundamental thing that seemed to come out of what people were saying was actually how can people retain some sense of control and input into what <coughs> actually happens. Um, and I think we are not yet, um, we haven't yet developed sufficiently um, robust models to take that seriously um, beyond um, suggesting um, to make sure that we can maintain confidentiality and privacy.